My name is Lois Anderson. I'm the Executive Director of Oregon Right to Life, and we're so excited to have you here this morning. It's so good to be in person, isn't it? While we've had to modify a lot of things, you know, uh, if you've been to our conferences before, um, we usually will have three to four hundred people in a whole day of a very different format, but um, I'm actually really excited about this COVID pivot. Um, sidewalk advocacy training has been on our wish list for quite a while, and um, it just, it, the details all fell together and worked out, and so I'm, I'm just really excited that you are here today to experience this uh, workshop. We, um, we had a, the class at, in Redmond um, on Thursday, which was also a, another great opportunity for us to be able to take this training to Central Oregon, and at that um, venue, we had people from Medford, and from Grants Pass and from Bend. And what you may not know is there's a Planned Parenthood clinic that does abortions in Grants Pass and Medford and Bend. So it was a really great opportunity um, to have some uh, training for people to work on the sidewalk in those places. And, um, and we're excited to have all of you here today. So hopefully you picked up note cards. Um, I have a few announcements um, before we kick everything off. Hopefully you picked up note cards. During our Q&A period, which there will be quite a few, um, we're going to be, there we go. Okay, now I'm <laughs> I need to hold a little up here. Um, we are going to ask you guys to write down your questions and then we'll ask them on the microphone. That'll help us with not passing around a microphone, but also so that everybody can hear the questions, which is really helpful. So um, be sure you can use those cards during the whole time. You know, don't wait till Q&A to write down your questions. So be sure you have cards. And if you need more, um, there will be more out on the registration table that you can pick up uh, during your breaks. Um, a reminder that we're not providing lunch today. Um, we love to be good hosts, but that just wasn't something we were able to do. Um, if you didn't bring your lunch, there are some dining options close by, or you might want to use one of the breaks to um, order something to be delivered. And um, during the lunch break, we are going to have our winning oratory contestant speak. So that may be something that you want to catch, although we are going to be doing a video of it and posting it on our YouTube channel. And uh, if you see families around today with one of these lanyards, if they're, they're not staff, um, they're participating in our state oratory contest. We have four contestants this year from around the state. And if you have a student in your life, or if you're involved with um, a school or a youth group, um, we would love for you to contact Nikki Snyder um, and get your group involved with our student contest. We have a drawing contest, an essay contest, a short film contest, and an oratory contest. And it's a wonderful way to help students um, use their creativity to think about um, the pro-life ethics and to express themselves in that way. And the winning drawings and essays are on our website, and we'll be showing the um, short film winners today um, during the program. Um, I do want to thank um, our sponsors who have stuck with us and been willing to pivot along with us and really provided the, um, the financial back backing that we needed to put this um, event on. Um, a special thank you to Parker Buildings, Vince and Mary Rigert, James and Jane Graybill, Mark and Trish Baker, Larry and Janice Cadell, and we have other sponsors on our webpage and on our slides up here, and just encourage you, um, if you have the opportunity to um, uh, thank them, to please do that. We also have some board members attending here this morning. Um, Oregon Right to Life and Oregon Right to Life Education Foundation both have boards of directors that meet quarterly. Um, they're my boss. <laughs> they um, spend a lot of time making sure that our organization is, is running well. And so I'd like you to stand up. Um, Linda Middlecoff, Joe Nielsen, and Joan Sage. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much for your service. I appreciate you and the, and the others as well. So we're joined today by um, Josh Brom from Equal Rights Institute and his colleague, Jacob. And uh, Josh is going to introduce Jacob later. So I have the honor to introduce Josh to you this morning. Um, he's a sought-after speaker. He's spoken to 
groups that have been thousands and, and groups that have been very small as well. And his primary passion is helping pro-life people to be more persuasive when they communicate with pro-choice people. And this means ditching faulty rhetoric and tactics and embracing arguments that hold under philosophical scrutiny. And if you've been to our conferences before, you've, um, you may have been able to take in Josh's workshops on um, not being weird, which he will have a, a version of today, <laughs> um, and other um, dialogue tips that are very um, essential in being having persuasive conversations. And I think this is especially applicable for us in Oregon because we live in a very culturally pro-choice place. And so um, having the tools to be able to communicate with people, um, whether they're abortion-minded women um, and families, which is what we're going to focus on today, or our friends and family, or people that we work with, um, it's important for us to be equipped. And I'm looking forward to the equipping that's going to happen today. I wanted to read you um, a quote since we're in the midst of our 40 days for life. And I know some of you here have participated in that. Um, this is a quote from David B. Wright about, um, who's the founder of 40 Days for Life, um, about Josh. Josh Brom is one of the brightest, most articulate, and innovative people in the pro-life movement. His cutting-edge work is helping people think more clearly, communicate more effectively, and most importantly, be better ambassadors for Christ. I wholeheartedly endorse Josh's work and encourage you to join me in following Josh and getting involved in his work today. I hope that you will join me in welcoming Josh Brown. Some of you have heard this story, but for those of you that haven't, I was in the Denver airport several years ago on a layover. Uh, I had like 45 minutes to just sit at my gate, eat a quick sandwich, and get on my last flight home. And I sat across from a businesswoman in her, in her late 30s who then asked me the question that I've spent my entire career hating. What do you do for a living? Ah. It's like, I have, I have a weird job. You know, who wants to talk to an abortion guy who just goes around and talks? It's like, like if she's pro-choice, how can I answer this question in a way that's not just going to start everything off on the wrong foot? And so I answered her question that day for the first time in a way that I'd never said before, um, which is something that Lois said earlier. I said, I try to help pro-life people to be less weird. And she smiled a little bit, and we ended up having a really good conversation. Now, I want to explain what I mean by that, okay? Because I don't mean I want to help pro-life people not be weird in the way that you Portland people use the term weird, like this kind of <laughs> positive, quirky way. That's not what I mean, okay? When I say weird, I mean something very specific. I mean, and I know that you've seen the, those pro-lifers that are well-meaning but off-putting. They are really sweet people with the best of intentions, but then they kind of shoot themselves in the foot in the sense of they kind of get in their own way by the way that they're acting, by the way that they're talking, which is not good. Greg Kokel is a Christian apologist, and he had this great quote. He said, the gospel message is offensive enough. Let's not add more offense to it. I would say the same thing about the pro-life. The pro-life message is offensive enough. Let's not add more offense to it. It is really hard to change someone's mind about abortion. It is hard sometimes to get someone to not have an abortion that day. If they were planning on having an abortion that day, let's not get in our, our, our own way. So, said another way, I want to help the whole pro-life movement to do a better job of living out Colossians 4, 5 through 6, which says, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech be filled with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. You know, one of the things that I love about that is it tells us you are not supposed to respond the same way to each person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That means that evangelism done well is more complicated than memorizing John 3.16 and the four spiritual laws and some Christianese slogans and bumper sticker sayings that you can say at people who are willing to listen to you. It's more complicated than that. We've been we're spending the last seven years trying to help pro-life people understand that people are complicated. They are not formulas. Can we stop treating them like formulas for a second and remember that they're people who are complicated, who have different needs on any given day? So since I've been talking for the last seven or eight years about helping pro-life people to not be weird, I get the common question. Well, what? give me an example. 
what is like a weird thing pro-life people do? So I'll give you an, a, an example, a general example. Um, and then we'll give you, we're going to give you a bunch of examples this morning of ways that sidewalk counselors can be well-meaning but off-putting. Um, that's why we have started with this talk. Don't be weird on the sidewalk because we don't want to get in our own way. But here's kind of a general example. It's something that I call fetus tunnel vision. Fetus tunnel vision is when pro-life people have the inability to acknowledge that something else bad is going on in the world without comparing it to abortion. So this is, these are some people, and this, there might be some people in this room that have done it. It's okay, no judgment, we are all doing our best to get more effective. But there are pro-life people, um, especially in the first five years after 9-11, where every anniversary of 9-11, they would post something like this. I'm sure you've seen this. Yes, 2,990 people died on 9-11, but do you know how many babies died on 9-12? 3,000. Or when a, when a school shooting happens, or that movie theater shooting in Colorado, in Aurora with the Joker guy at the Dark Knight, remember that? I have a friend, a colleague, who that day made a meme and posted, it wasn't just trying to get pro-life people's attention, he was posting like pro-choice Facebook groups that had on one side the movie theater shooting, it was 25 or whatever, how many people got killed, and then on the other side, Colorado Planned Parenthood. It's like 30 babies or whatever it was. And it's just, it just like, Here's the problem. I get it. I understand. We all get it, right? We understand this thing, that if only people understood that 3,000 babies are getting killed every day, then like maybe more people would figure that out and we could stop killing so many of them. They just need to understand what we understand, right? And so then we get weird. Because for other people, for people outside the pro-life movement, when they see us doing that, it says to them something that's not true of us, which is that we only care about one thing. That's not true of us. We know that there's other bad things going on. We know that sex trafficking is bad too, right? We just, but it's like, it comes across like we only care about one thing. To the point that we will actually try to hijack other bad things that are going on and try to like use that and get people to care about our thing. So then it looks like we've got a broken moral compass. That's a problem if people think that you've got a broken moral compass because if they do, they won't be able to take your moral ideas seriously including your views about abortion. So, to lay some foundation for a lot of the practical advice that we are going to give you for sidewalk counseling today, we wanted to spend this morning sharing with you some of the things not to do and some of the things to do. So we're going to talk about good opening lines. We're going to talk about good signs. We're also going to talk about some bad signs. We're going to talk about a lot of the different kinds of things that just kind of help you get a sense of what is our heart for sidewalk counseling. And then we're going to get into some more specifics. So Jacob, talk to us a bit about something that you told me one time when we were talking about fetus tunnel vision that I thought was so interesting. It's like, it made me stop for a second. You said, yeah, sidewalk counselors get fetus tunnel vision too. Talk about that. Yeah, we, we have this goal in mind. We want to save babies and I'm not deterring from that. That is, that is the case. That's one of the big things we want to do there in front of the abortion clinic. And sometimes we get so focused on saving the baby, we forget the human being in front of us. And the way that plays out sometimes is you'll hear a sidewalk counselor say something like, you don't want to have an abortion. Don't do this. And the person may say something back like, I can't afford a baby right now. I just can't do this. And the sidewalk counselor will come back with, yeah, but you don't want to kill your baby. Or, yes, you can just straight up arguing with them. Or sometimes they'll say something like, I'm just in a really bad situation. I, 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 I don't really have a place to live. I can't have a baby right now. I'm scared. And this is just more than I can handle. And the person will say, but abortion's wrong. You, 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 you're going to love that baby. You're gonna, that baby will love you. It's going to change your life. And they're thinking in their head, you haven't heard a word I just said. You're focused on, on the baby, and I'm worried about preserving my life, staying around, like not being homeless or getting my education. It seems like none of that matters. We, we can get so focused on the mom and not her problems. And... I just want to, I can't emphasize this enough. 
if you help the mother, your chances of saving that baby go sky high. And, and you'll hear me show this an example later, but if you can focus on what she needs, being there for her, your chances of saving that child go way up. And I'll just also encourage you, this is not like some, some uh, manipulative tactic. I think it's actually important that we do help people. Yeah. We do help, people the, help the people who are in front of us. Ever since releasing the Sidewalk Counseling Masterclass, which has been a, what, a year and a half now, I think, um, we get emails sometimes from people who have Sidewalk Counseling questions. What do you think about this technique? What do you think about this sign? What do you think about this <clears> idea? And if they email us, it's super easy for me. I just forward them to Jacob because Jacob's the expert. I'm not a sidewalk counselor, okay? I'm a philosopher. I'm a speaker. I'm like, I run the thing. I help make the class, but he's the expert behind it, right? And so I just send them to Jacob. But if I'm out doing a talk somewhere and someone comes up to me, well, I don't get to just like, you know, can you hang on a second? Let me call Jacob. Like, I don't do that. And so uh, when people ask me about a certain idea, a certain thing that they do, I have kind of a general principle, a rubric that I'm running through my mind. And so this might help you as you think about different things that we can do on the sidewalk. Is I'm, is we ought to be asking ourselves questions like this. Does this make me more approachable or less approachable? And this is a harder question. Does this serve the people that I'm trying to help or does this make me feel better? Because sometimes... We get into where we're doing things. It's kind of like we forget who our audience is. Pro-choice people tend to think very differently than we do. So anytime, like this goes with like pro-life arguments too. Like it's not always the arguments that we find the most persuasive that work the best for pro-choice people because they think differently. Um, and so we ought to be trying to figure out, okay, what's going to be help, most helpful to them and how can I be as approachable as possible. There's another principle that I think is really valuable that I learned at the CareNet conference a couple of years ago. I spoke at CareNet, and then I went to this digital marketing workshop. So it's like for like nonprofit leaders about email subject lines and how to build your donation page, like things like that. And I didn't. I went to it because I didn't. There was nothing else for me to do, and I didn't think I was going to learn anything. And then I, I learned stuff for the whole time. I was like, I know nothing. This is so good. Best works I've been to for a long time. None of it would be very interesting to you, but it was great for me. But there was a really interesting point in the beginning where they're talking about, like, generally speaking, when nonprofit leaders, you know, build a donation page, they said, you need to do stuff based on data, not your intuitions. They said, your intuitions are probably wrong. And there's groups that have actually tested, like A-B tested, to try to figure out how to do these things and kind of optimize them. And so like, then they had like an infographic about how to have an optimized donation page. And I'm looking at them like, everything I've done with my donation page is wrong. <laughs> like, I, like my intuitions were completely backwards. So I like reworked the entire thing like that afternoon. I was like, this is crazy. So I think the same thing for us. Your intuitions will sometimes be wrong. And so you should be trying to pay attention. What is working? What is not? Like Jacob, when you try something... Does that seem to be working better or does it seem to be working less good even if you kind of expected it would work better? There's something else that I want to say before we get into some of the specifics that's really important. Some of the examples that we're going to talk about this morning are inherently funny. Mm -hmm. And we need to remember that these people, these, the examples we're going to talk about, they all mean well. They hate abortion. They're doing their best. And what I don't want to have happen is for you to be like, oh my goodness, I don't want to go out there because I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake, okay? Because it is better to go out there and make a mistake or two than to feel frozen and like, I can't, I, I can't go out there. I don't want to make any mistakes. It is so much better to go out there, make some mistakes, and just be trying to make fewer of them in the future. That is so much better than just being at home, Okay? Um, so don't feel discouraged by the list, but by this list. Just use this list to make yourself more effective and to help the well-meaning people around you to be more effective too. And if you disagree with any of the things on this list, there's going to be some controversial ones. You might disagree with some of these. That's okay. We would love to talk to you today about that. We're totally fine. You can't hurt our feelings. I'm also not saying that none of these examples will never work. God can use just about anything to save a baby. What we're saying is that not all techniques are equally effective, save as, and we want to save as many babies 
as possible. I'm kind of trying to explain something. I had to try to explain to a sidewalk counselor on Facebook just a couple of weeks ago who posted this comment. He said, my effectiveness does not depend on the perception of others. And my friend JP, who's taken our sidewalk counseling masterclass, responded with exactly the right thing. He said, yes, it does. It depends entirely on the perceptions of the people that he claimed to be trying to help. Like, this would be like a, a salesman with a really bad sales record. Like, he never makes sales. This is like look, look, Ryan in the office. Remember, like, Ryan, like, forever in the office doesn't make any sales for a really long time? Because this would be like Ryan be like, well, my effectiveness doesn't depend on how many sales I make. Or the person It's like, yeah. In this case, unfortunately, it does. So our attitude in general is that we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We're just trying to figure out the most effective ways to help empower as many moms to save as many babies as possible. So Jacob, one more thing before we get into specifics and get into the fun stuff. Talk to us a little bit. I know this will be review for some because I know there's some sidewalk counselors in here who already get this. But I just want to make sure everyone is on the same page. Talk a little bit about the psychology that is going on with abortion-minded women and their drivers. Yeah, uh, before I'm going to go there, I just feel like I want to say that uh, a lot, I made so many mistakes and still make mistakes on the sidewalk. And uh, some, I, I feel like some of the things that we're going to say, you don't do here, this is a really bad idea, I've done some of them. And so uh, don't feel like we're being hard on you or anything if, if you're doing any of these things. Yep. I've made enormous mistakes on the sidewalk. I won't even tell you what they are. They're so embarrassing to me. It's not because it's like some immoral thing I did. It's just like, how did I possibly think that was a good idea? Uh, <clears throat> but when I, when I first started sidewalk counseling, or before I, let me back up before that, I was doing, I was working for Justice for All. They're wonderful people. I consider them some good friends of mine to this day. And I was doing a lot of outreach at college universities. And so I was meeting a lot of college students, a lot of pro-choice people, having a lot of philosophical discussions about abortion and getting into some great dialogue with people. And I thought, okay, I kind of have this down. I'll go do that at the abortion clinic. I've never been to the abortion. I'd been in I'd been in pro-life work for years before I went to the abortion clinic. And so my first day going to the abortion clinic was by the wonderful, it was put up by those just wonderful organization, 40 Days for Life, who I absolutely love. Yep. And they had like a prayer vigil before the clinic opened. A bunch of people came. We had a prayer thing there before the sun came up. And I decided, hey, I'm going to stick around and, and see what happens and maybe get into conversations with people. And I started kind of talking to some other sidewalk counselors, and it did not take long for me to realize all the philosophy and the thought experiments and those tools I had learned and used so often, I just didn't use them at the abortion clinic. Yeah. So one... One of the ways that I found really helpful to kind of compare the two of crisis situation and non-crisis situation. So an abortion-minded person, and they've got an abortion scheduled, they're trying to get out of this situation. It's like you're talking to someone who is in a burning building. It's like they feel like they're in a burning building. They have get out of the fire tunnel vision. Yeah, and they're just trying to get out. And they see an exit, and there's the exit, and they go, okay, I'm, I'm probably going to get burned if I go out that exit, but there, I don't have any other choice. There's no other exit. I'm not asking that you agree with that thought that they have. I'm just asking that you understand that is how they feel. Yep. On the contrary, when I was at the university and I was talking to a pro-choice person who was not in a crisis situation, it was like we were standing from a safe distance watching a burning build, a burning build, a building burn, and we were going, what's going to be the best way to put that fire out? We could have a calm, reasonable discussion. It's not that having discussions with uh, abortion-minded people is, is this panic-stricken kind of thing, but there is this feeling of... If I have this child, 
It will be the death of me. Not physical, but some kind of psychological. Like the death of their dreams. The death of their hopes. The death of how they know themselves at this time and who they are and who they want to become. All those things will come to an end if this child's born. It's really important that we pro-lifers understand that's where they're coming from. I've heard some really hurtful things from pro-life people. Well, the only reason she's there is because she's selfish. No, it's much more complicated than that. A lot of them even consider themselves to be pro-life, right? So there's a lot of you that have seen this quotation before, but I think it's just so apt. I want everyone to have seen it, which is the one from Frederica Matthews Green. Um, she's the former vice president of communications for Feminists for Life, and she said, no woman wants an abortion as she wants an ice cream cone or a Porsche. She wants an abortion as an animal caught in a trap wants to gnaw off its own leg. There's this strange dueling beliefs, but I want to get into one of them just a little bit. And and it's played out in my experience at the abortion clinic where I can't remember in the hundreds of people I've talked to, I, I can't remember ever talking to someone and having to convince them that they're pregnant with a baby. I'm not trying to say, no, it's not a clump of cells, it's a human being. I've done that many times on the college campus. In front of the abortion clinic, it's like they just have accepted, they intuitively know, I have a baby, but I can't have this baby. So we're going to talk this morning, we're going to kind of transition to a list of some things to avoid. We're going to talk about what to wear, what not to wear. We're going to talk about good signs versus bad signs, which is a really common question that we get. We're going to talk about some good opening lines versus some not so good opening lines. So Jacob, why don't we start by talking about some things to avoid? Yeah, let's not bring uh, baby dolls. Keep the baby dolls. Uh, or any kind of fake blood, blood patterns on shirts, any, any fake blood. Leave it at home. That stays with Halloween stuff. Not at the abortion clinic. Here's an example. No. Here's Alan Keyes leading a peak of... Let's zoom in a little bit. I don't know what's happening with the guy behind, by the way. He's wearing some kind of a mask. I don't know what's going on there, but it's really creepy. It, if you understand or have just a basic idea of how a pro-choice person or abortion-minded person sees this, you're going to know very quickly they are not going to go talk to these people. I would love to talk to them, but more as like, <laughs> what are you thinking? What's going through your mind at this time? How is this going to be effective? Uh, this speaks loudly to pro-life people. It also speaks loudly to pro-choice people, but I promise it's not the message you want them to have. Um, I, I, I'll just tell you, like when I first saw this picture, I saw what was printed on their shirts. I thought it was a graphic visual of a child killed by abortion. It's actually not. But when I saw that, that's what I thought. We just have to wonder, what does the, what is the, what is the pro-choice or abortion-minded person think when they see something like this. And the bottom line is, they're not approachable. Uh, we love, you know, those little fetal models. I think they're 12 weeks. Uh, I have those. I keep them in my pocket. I use them in the right context. But I'm very careful with it. I never put fake blood on it and sneak it in somebody's hand. That's a horrible idea. Uh, and... I'm careful with the context, I, and I, I recognize, how, how, what, what are people seeing? I want to show you an example of how not to use a fetal model. Um, hey team, this is Cletus the fetus, and I'm out at the abortion clinic with Mark this morning, and it's around noontime right now, and we're out here praying, and I just appreciate all you do to try to help people like me. Like, this guy seems really sweet. Right? Mm -hmm. But the way that my mind thinks is like, I'm thinking about the people walking down the sidewalk to have their abortion and seeing like this guy doing this thing with his phone camera and his fetal model. It's like, I don't think he's as approachable that way. But this isn't as bad as we, I mean, so I mean, here's another thing don't put feet baby dolls in trees. I'm just mm -hmm. going to recommend that. 
They're not Easter eggs. We're not, dec- we're not decorating places with them. This is, kind of, this is strange looking. But it's not as bad as the baby doll story that Jacob was told by Dr. Pat Castle. You've got to hear this one. Yeah, one of the things I do, one of my very weird hobbies is I like collecting strange stories from uh, sidewalk <laughs> counselors. So if you have a strange story, I'd just love to hear that later. Please tell him. Um, yeah, it, maybe at lunch or something, you could share that with me. But this one, so I, I'll tell you and let you be the judge. Uh, Pat went to the abortion clinic one day to do some sidewalk counseling. At this particular clinic, they put up like an eight-foot-tall privacy fence. It's a common thing abortion clinics do. So... This man, not Pat, this man decided, amen, decided to bring like a 12-foot A-frame ladder, and he climbed to the top of the ladder and sat on it. Not a bad strategy. I don't, I don't particularly have a problem with that. Uh, but then this is where it got weird. He put on a lab coat. If you're not a doctor, don't wear a lab coat. I highly doubt this man was a doctor. He then decided to cover the lab coat with blood. I don't know if he did it up on the thing or if he did it before he went up there, but he was covered, his lab coat's covered in blood. Um, As if this wasn't enough of a message, he brought a deep sea fishing reel or rod and reel. He took the, the, the fishing line on the end of the pole and he tied a baby doll to it. I think you might know where I'm going with this. Then squirted fake blood all over this baby doll. And he sat on top of this letter. And he cast the baby doll into the parking lot. And then he reeled it back in. This story helped me understand that it's not unreasonable when pro-choice people call us crazy if this is the kind of thing they see. We should have a little compassion there and go you know what, I've seen some pretty crazy and heard some pretty crazy stories. I'm sorry, on behalf of the pro-life movement, they do exist. I'm trying to curb that. I'm trying to knock it back in a peaceful way, but there are some crazies out there, and I hope that you realize I'm not one of them. Um, don't wear costumes, like any costumes. No costumes. We're just going to just like make it just basically a rule. Don't wear a fake belly. Uh, anything that covers your face, except for the COVID thing, like wear, wear a mask out there, like obviously, but anything else. So like popular costumes in front of the abortion clinic, I know it's because I've seen a lot of pictures of different guys in Grim Reaper costumes. This is super approachable. You want to talk to that guy, right? You just want to like go right up there and have like a whole long conversation with him, right? Now, a kind of a funny story, uh, when we, I, I ran... Fresno's first 40 Days for Life campaign. I only did it once because I was not good at it, but I ran it the first time because we didn't have anyone else to do it. And, uh, and so I spent a lot of time out there um, in the first couple of weeks. Like the, the day two, I was like out there for six hours because I had not done a good job of getting people to come and also be there. And so I, it was just had to be me. And so my wife came out there with me sometimes, and she was nine months pregnant with our first child. Now, we found out later that Planned Parenthood actually thought that she was wearing a fake belly. It wasn't a fake belly. This was our child. We actually gave birth to our oldest during the first 40 Days for Life campaign. My boss had to give me like a week off and him run the campaign. And then I brought Noah out to like the final part of the campaign. So we didn't wear a fake belly. Don't wear a fake belly. Um, Also, there's certain kinds of conversations that you want to be careful about having. Like, I mean, I think generally it's kind of hard to sometimes not be talking to our friends while we're sidewalk or doing like an outreach because like we're seeing our friends and stuff. But it's like you got to remember, what is our goal? What is, what, what is our, our mission here? We want to help women and save babies. But especially conversations like about like violent movies or explosions or something like that. You can understand if somebody just hears a snippet of that, it could kind of freak them out. Remember that abortion clinic workers work behind bulletproof glass. And there's a reason for that. And I don't think we have sometimes enough sympathy for like what that psychologically does to someone. There's a reason that they do that. Also, don't bring musical instruments if the clinic is open. We're not trying to recreate a church service here. If it's closed, fine. I'll, I'll, I, I, the, the, that final 40 days for life hour, kind of like we've got a bunch of people there. We want to kind of close it. But it's like 8 p.m. I brought my acoustic guitar. We sang a few worship songs and missed the, the prayer and everything. I think that's probably fine. No one saw. But like, don't bring a shofar. 
These are like these Israeli kind of horns, uh, and they're very symbolic to people. And sometimes people would just come to Planned Parenthood. We're praying. We're trying to reach out to people, and suddenly you hear, Brah! And everyone's like looking around like, what is that? And then sometimes like they're walking around the block, you know, blowing this horn. And like sometimes like, and I'm like, why aren't you walking around seven times while you're doing that? Um, I don't know if they think that the walls are going to come tumbling down. They never have. Uh, but this is just, this is super kind of distracting. Don't bring badly behaved kids. It's not a good incentive to have kids if you bring badly <laughs> Don't you want this? Yeah, <laughs> right? They're Notice great. I didn't say don't bring kids. Yeah. Be really clear about that. I did not say that. Uh, two of my kids, um, I, can prob- I can bring pretty much any time. Um, the other three, hit or miss, I'm going to have to feel it out what's happening that day. But if your kids can behave well, I want to encourage you to consider bringing them. And... Let's talk a little bit about prep for bringing them. You well, wanna... f- first, talk about why. Talk about why you want okay. them there. Uh, I want you to consider bringing your kids. I'm like so on the line of just saying bring your kids, but I, I don't want to tell you to do that if you're not comfortable. So why to bring your kids is kids have this beautiful thing where if you put, like if you get into a room with strangers and there's kids in there, the kids just come right together. They just start playing. They don't need any social norms of all the stuff that we have to go through as adults. They just start playing together. And that's a beautiful thing. Well, at the abortion clinic, people often have a hard time finding childcare. So there's usually a driver. There might be the abortion-minded woman is inside the clinic going through all that stuff. Not even at the point of having an abortion can take hours before that happens. But the kids are bored, they're tired of sitting in the car, they're getting restless, so they start playing around in the parking lot. Well, if your kids are there on the sidewalk, they almost always start coming together and playing. Now, the parents aren't going to just let the kids wander too far, so they come over there. Now you've got a common thing that you can talk about. You talk about kids. That is a great way to start a conversation. I've seen many children pulled out of the abortion clinic, unborn children pulled out of the abortion clinic because someone brought their kids and the kids started the conversation. They're just phenomenal conversation starters. So before you bring your kids, you need to have some prep work with them though. I would not recommend just bringing them and not telling them what's going on. One, you're going to have to, well, let me talk about the other. I want to let Josh talk. He's got a great story for this. But you want to talk to him about bringing toys, sharing their toys with other kids. You want to go over safety. Uh, your kids are there with you. They really can't go onto the abortion clinic property. They, they're trespassing, and you're responsible for that. You can get in trouble, let alone your kids. Who knows what the clinic's going to say about you letting your kids wander. So you want to have them in a safe, kind of contained area. You want to talk that through with your kids so you're not getting distracted when you're in a conversation. You can bring your kids in and and help them understand it's really good that you want to play with other kids. I want to encourage you to do that. Here's some ways you can do it. Here's some toys you can bring. Here's where you can go. Here's how long we're going to be here. Bring some snacks. Bring some water. Make sure they're comfortable. Uh, And you want to prep them as to why you're there and how much you tell them and don't tell them is going to be a little bit complicated, but I want Josh, I think he, he, he and his wife handled that really well. Would you yeah, so our oldest two, two sons, so I've got three sons, 12, 10, and 8. Um, so our house is super quiet and clean. <sighs> Their parents are sane. It's really good to be here. <laughs> um, and so our oldest two know about abortion. Our oldest found out because he was helping clean my office and he stumbled across like my bio with people saying like nice things about me. And he was like... <gasps> Like suddenly like saw me as like something uh, very impressive for the first time in his entire life. But William, our 10-year-old, he finds out about abortion because I went on a speaking trip. I was speaking a couple of years ago at, the, at one of the national pro-life conferences in, in D.C. And, you know, I was doing a lot of these speaking trips. And so William comes to my wife, Hannah, and says, Mommy, what does Daddy do? And my wife is like totally not wanting to get into it, okay? So she's like, 
he's a he's a he, he's a nonprofit leader. Like, what kid is going to ask what that means, right? <laughs> and he's like, oh. But what what does he do? <laughs> and so he's like, well, you know, he's a speaker and and, and a writer. Oh. But what does he do? Like, what, like is, he, is, he, is he help people? What, is, like, what does that mean? And so he's like, oh, gosh, okay. So he's like, well, you know how mommies get, get, have, have, have babies in their bellies before they're born? My kids used to call them basketball babies because when my wife got pregnant, she looked like she had a basketball under her shirt. She just goes up straight out, but boom. Uh, and so they're calling basketball babies. Like, you know how, how mommies get basketball babies? And he's like, yeah. He's like, well, there are some moms that, that when they have those basketball babies, they're, they're really freaked out, and they don't feel like they can handle this right now, and, and, the, and some of them hire a doctor to kill their baby. And he goes, but that's so rude! That was his first reaction. And then he's like processing. And he's like, that's inappropriate. <laughs> And he processes a little more. He says, wait, a but it's wrong to kill people unless they're trying to kill you. So he's already a philosopher. <laughs> he's already making distinctions. I don't know where he got that. Uh, but, you know, and so, you know, so my wife explains, yeah, so he goes out and tries to help, help people to, to not do that. He's like, ah. So he does try to help people. Okay. And then he walked away. But I really like that. And part of the explanation, like we had never, like we had not prepped to have that conversation. I don't know why. We're bad parents. But, but, but like I like that Hannah naturally was kind of like, you know, like th there was compassion for the woman in even her explanation. It wasn't about there are all these baby killers out there. It's like she's freaked out. She doesn't know what to do. So I think I would at least suggest in what you're explaining, like make sure that your kids have compassion on the people there. You're there to help people. You're not there to judge people. You're there to help and hey, if they bring their kids, you can totally play with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was, there's another day, I'm at the clinic. I have some other wonderful sidewalk counselors there with me. And uh, this car drove up out of state. And I'm going, I think they're from Tennessee. I'm from Georgia. I said something like, Tennessee, that's a, that's a long drive. You must, you're already having a long day. Sorry for you. I'm sorry for what you're going through. And the guy kind of stopped, and he looked at me, and, and I was like, you know, well, come on down, and let's, let's talk. And he started to, and then some of my wonderful friends who are just great heart started praying very loud. And, and they were Catholic, I'm Protestant, doesn't matter what denomination they were, because even if Protestants would have been doing something like this, it would have had the same effect, which uh, once they started this loud prayer, they were saying a Hail Mary, and it just turned that guy right off. He was like, oh, what kind of weird weirdos are we? I don't think you're weirdos or anything, okay? I, I, I want you praying all the time. I want you praying at the clinic. I just want you to be mindful of how it looks to people who aren't familiar with church. They're yeah. not familiar with the love that you and I have experienced, many of us have experienced. Yeah. All they know is what Hollywood's told them, and let's be honest, it's probably not the best perception. Some of them may have been really abused by the church. So we just want to be really careful with what we're portraying, per portraying to people yeah. in how we, how we pray and uh, chants and singing we had talked about. Before you go on, let me make a couple of points that we were going to make before you said that. So if your kid, all that to say, looks like this, don't bring the kid to the <laughs> clinic, okay? And one other thing uh, on kind of the religious note, don't fling holy water onto the building, mm -hmm. okay? Again, I love my Catholic brothers and sisters. I love Catholics. I'm not Catholic, but we, we've had this super you know, theologically diverse staff. I love that. I mean, we've had Armenians like me and uh, Eastern Orthodox people and Catholics and Calvinists, including a Calvinist who was so Calvinist that his wife had a tulip tattooed to her forearm. Okay, we have a lot of diversity on the staff. I love Catholics. But if you're flinging holy water onto the building, pe other people don't know if you're flinging water or gasoline onto the building, okay? You understand how, the, how this can look. And also be careful about 
loud praying. Okay, <laughs> would you like to talk about what people should wear? Yeah, how we dress can be really important. Let's talk about what to wear. Dress nicely, but casually. Uh, you want to look well-groomed and put together. Uh, <clears throat> wear comfortable shoes. I know this probably seems obvious to most people, but I, I've had so many people, they come out in those like flats that have no cushion or anything, and, and their feet are killing them so that I, we lose a great sidewalk counselor because they're just miserable. Uh, I actually want you wearing sports attire. It's good to wear sports attire. Like if you are a fan of a baseball team or football team or, or whatever it is, the reason I want that is because it, it is a great conversation starter with people. It's how you can be relatable. Even if somebody comes up with a rival team, you can use that. You could say something like, you shouldn't have a hard time talking to me. I mean, your team just killed us. <laughs> the Florida Gators just, they just ran right over us. And so, you know, it's like, I'm not abusive. I don't beat anybody because I'm a Georgia fan. So, <laughs> you, you know, you could say something like that. You can use that sports stuff to your it advantage. It doesn't have to be funny. Like, part of the point is, sure. like, even just trying to be funny is a lot of the point of something like that because it's like, okay. He's cool. He's not super serious. It makes a big difference. I keep uh, like emergency clothes in my car. I keep like long johns, a jacket, and, and like a, a rain jacket uh, with me. If you think it might be raining or if it has rained, it's a really good idea to have like mud boots on. You know, like those galoshes can be good if they are pretty appropriate and not like too big and bulky and like you just stepped off the farm but they've got some kind of stylish ones. Those are actually, this is just kind of a side note, they're nice because sometimes when you're talking, excuse me, to an abortion-minded person, you're not able to stand in the most comfortable ground. You're just trying to get to wherever, and there might be mud and debris, and you might be standing in the middle of a mud puddle. If you got those boots on, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually went and found, I did some research and found this giant, umbrella like four people can fit underneath it and it's still social distancing that's really handy for when it's pouring rain my sidewalk counseling friends if i invite somebody over there's plenty of room to get in there and talk uh bring a bigger the umbrella the better i i mean i got like one of those that that is for uh you know like like a picnic table thing or whatever where they have those giant it's great and it's a little heavy but it's fine it's fine Make sure you're not going to like blow away with it, like, you know, or something like that. <laughs> Let's talk about what not to wear. Big jewelry. Even any kind of costume jewelry, especially if it's real, you just, there, there, there's a, um, it can be a connotation with having that big stuff on, and it's a distraction for the abortion minded person. Um, okay, this is an important one. No, mil I love my... No, jogging clothes. Yeah, jogging clothes. There's an order to these. <laughs> <laughs> that you don't want to look like you're out for a jog and you just stop for a few minutes. Now you're, you just, you look out of place. Yeah. And um, I've had people that it's like they, they went to the gym before they came to the clinic. And so then they come to the clinic and it looks like they're on their way to the gym. It doesn't, it doesn't really fit. So... Uh, th I love my, our brothers and sisters in the military. I am not bashing them at all. I just want to encourage you to not look like you have anything um, combative. Remember, a lot of people are being told we're violent and having camouflage, backpacks, um, definitely don't wear any fanny packs. Um, I like, fan I have worn these in the past. I'm not bashing you. I, I get it. They're very handy. Uh, but, but like, our millennials here are like, duh. Okay, that's why. Because millennials are like, you, you, you're so off-putting if you wear these. I know was, they're comfortable and they work. It was really funny two days ago doing the seminar in Redmond when after we did this presentation, some, Lois had to make an announcement, someone's missing a fanny pack? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, don't, uh, we have these like denim jumpsuits. I don't know why us homeschoolers, I grew up in the homeschool community. I was homeschooled my whole life. Careful that you don't look like it though. It's when, just not related. When my family first walked into church at the church that I would meet, that, 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 that I met my wife, my wife remembers the day that we all walked in because she immediately pointed and said, homeschoolers. <laughs> like she could tell. Like we have a look, okay? Like we, I didn't know how to dress at all. Like, you know, my mom, I love my mom, but she had no idea. And so like we had the polo shirts tucked into her jeans, no belt, you know, like really bad haircut. And yeah, we just like, it, there's, a, there's a certain look. It's like when we culturally just like hang out with each other, we all dress alike and we, we think it looks great. Anyway. You don't want to overdress either. So yeah. um, like suits and ties. I'm going to go back to The Office. If any of you have seen The Office, there was an episode where Jim, uh, as kind of a joke, wore a tuxedo to work. And then his regional um, manager, like one of the head guys came in and he... He, he never, didn't think it was funny. He did not think it was funny. Never, that was started off on the wrong foot, never got to where you could get along with that manager. It was tough from then on. You could run into the same kind of thing because you just don't look relatable if you overdress with like a suit and tie. Yeah. Um, I want you to be the pro-life message, not, not your, your attire, not your shirt. Yeah, especially that middle one, that's not approachable. <laughs> If you're thinking about having an abortion that day. I've practiced doing this with Josh, and I still can't get past the middle one. <laughs> so, you should, you, or, or, or were you going to talk about it? Are you going to say the interesting thing about but with signs? Yeah. I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, I am going to go there. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk about signs in a little bit here. And signs are different than clothes because when you have these clothes on, you... You've always got it. There's this message that's always being pushed out. When you're holding a sign, one of the first things I do when I start a conversation with somebody is I drop the sign to my side. I'll often even just throw it off. I'll just throw it in the bushes or whatever. I'll get it later. <laughs> but I just throw it off. It's very inappropriate to start taking your clothes off. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Don't be weird. There's a lot of... I don't think we have to explain why that's a problem in today's culture, but... Don't do that. So, like have, ha, having messaging on your shirt is very shouty. Like, like mm -hmm. when I'm at an outreach, and if I see two pro-choice women coming to the table, and one of them has like a super pro-abortion shirt on, guess which one I would rather talk to? Right? Like it goes both ways. Like it indicates this is part of your identity. Like this is like you're passionate about this. Probably not as likely to be open-minded as the person who's wearing neutral clothing. It has an opinion. We all have opinions, but like it's not like part of like I'm I'm gonna wear this today. Do not wear political messaging. It's an immediate turnoff for our our pro-choice friends. It's it's our politics are just too hot right now. I want you to be more approachable. Typically, people who are talking about politics are not doing it well and so there's just a lot of gasoline on that fire i don't want you adding more to it um i'm, I'm gonna step on some i may step on some toes here and I, that's not my intent i'm not saying anything positive or negative i'm making a neutral statement about what's effective at the abortion clinic don't wear a maga hat don't wear any maga clothing i'm not telling you if that's like, I agree or disagree. We can have that discussion later. I'm simply trying to help you understand what is going to be effective at the abortion clinic. If you have that stuff on, you're shut down. You've lost so many conversations that could have moved to a place of getting a kid out. So just be mindful yeah. of the perception of the message that you've got on. I had to try to explain this to someone one time. I was going to, I've got, you know, we're going to talk about the way that we use abortion images uh, in, in a little bit, but, you know, we don't put them on signs. This is something that we do. We always use them with consent. And, and, but I'm friends with a lot of people who do put 
put graphic abortion visuals on signs, and you know they're not my enemy. We're all on the same team. We might think a little bit differently, and uh, but so one of them invited me to have coffee with him so we could actually have a discussion um, about about the use of, of of graphic signs. And it wasn't our first conversation. We'd had lots of conversations before. It had some rapport built up, and I said, sure. I'd be happy to grab coffee and we can, we can talk about that. So I went there expecting to have an interesting debate about a really complicated issue of, of how we try to share the truth of abortion with people. I did not go there expecting to have to spend the first 30 minutes of our debate trying to convince him that if he's on a college campus trying to have conversations with young pro-choice women that he should not be wearing a MAGA hat. He's an old white man. And he's like, no, this is great. I want them to see my MAGA hat. And I'm like, look, you, I, I know that you're a good guy, but they don't. And there is a certain perception of, of, from, for the other side, from people on the left, of what that means, what that symbolizes. And it includes mistreatment of women. Okay, like it or not, that messaging comes across with that hat. At this point, that's the way it's received. And so again, it's about know your audience. Know the way that they are going to perceive different things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you don't want to look like you're homeless. I, I was on my way to the abortion clinic one morning. I was running late, full disclosure. And, and I got a phone call. Hey, Jacob, you're on your way? Yeah, okay, great. We, we could use some help here and whatever. But we had this funny thing happen. Whoa, what happened? Well... We were, we were here, and we had our signs, and, okay, first of all, I know these people. They're wonderful people, and I dearly love them, and they, their, their dress attire is not what we need to be at. One of these guys, um, he has, I think it's a cool shirt. It's the kind of shirt you should wear. The Olympics came to Georgia in 1996. He had one of the original Olympic t-shirts from 1996. The problem is... It's how old now? 25? What is that? 25 years? Something like that? It looks like a 25-year-old t-shirt. It's got holes in it. It's faded. But he's wearing this shirt. And you get up close, it's like, that's cool. That's vintage, right? But, <laughs> but it also looks like, you know, you pulled it out of a rag pile. And so my other friends were there, and they have signs that are covered in, you know, so I think they even had a cardboard sign, and they, you know, they wrote something on. And I like homemade signs, but not cardboard. And and they have <laughs> duct tape on all their signs. And so they're there, and they have their signs. And this couple came to the abortion clinic, and half their clothes are threadbare. Anyway, they, and, and this couple came to the abortion clinic, and they they didn't speak any English, and they couldn't read English. So they walked down to the sidewalk counselors to give them money because they felt so bad for them. They thought they were homeless people begging for money with their signs in their dress attire. This should be a hint. Here's another general rule. If the abortion-minded people are giving you money, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> But you also don't want to be wearing, like, country club attire. This came up on a recent podcast, uh, my favorite podcast I've ever recorded now. We, it's the last one we put out. It's awesome. Go subscribe to the Equip for Life podcast. Watch this episode or listen to it if you prefer. It's great. It's with our mutual friend, Josh Harris. He's a really cool guy, super humble guy. He's a professional comedian. And uh, Jacob kind of recruited him to, to do sidewalk counseling and actually lead uh, and kind of organize a group of sidewalk counselors in Atlanta. They trained them up through the sidewalk counseling master class, and they've been out there. In the last six to nine months, they've saved like probably at least 60 babies. It's been mm. awesome. It's like, here's this comedian. He, he's used to working on cruise ships. Well, there's no cruise ship work to be doing right now, right? And so he's like, I am just going to spend a whole bunch of my life trying to serve people. He's super cool. So I had him on the podcast to talk about humor. Because like, it's really important when possible to, to bring humor into our dialogues. And he was saying, I even use humor on the sidewalk. So that was what the podcast was about. But I'm going to play you a little clip from it, though, because uh, you can see where the country club attire could actually be kind of a problem. And pay attention to the organics of the environment. You right? turn it up. Like, what is going on in this moment? I remember one time I was talking to a gentleman and I was, I don't even know why, I must have come from like a mass service or something potentially, but I was out on the sidewalk 
in like khakis and like a pink sh- pink sweater. I mean, it was like the Carlton Bank starter <laughs> kit or something. You know? from I, Easter service. Yeah, I don't know why I was. I mean, I was. Str- I mean, I was very like country club at that for whatever. <laughs> I don't know why, but yeah, uh, I was. And so I said, "Hey, man, I'd love to hear your story." And this guy like stepped out of the car and he said something along the lines. I'm paraphrasing, but like. Uh, you don't want to hear my story. I'm from the streets. And I looked at myself uh-huh. and was like, can't you tell? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like, I'm literally decked out in, you know, I mean, the, you know, exactly what you would expect someone in a country club to be sporting. So, right. so like, so Josh was super quick on his feet and was able to kind of handle that situation. But you can see like how unrelatable he was to that person. He, this guy is thinking, you can't relate to anything that I have to say. So again, just like you want to be thinking about these things when you think about what you're writing. Let's talk about science. This has got to be like one of the most common questions that we get mm-hmm. is like, what do you think about this sign? Or what are your favorite signs? Or like things like that. So let's talk about some good signs and then we'll talk about some bad signs. Yeah. So here's a, I'm just going to go over like a list of the signs I like to use that I found helpful. Uh, I'd love to hear from other people if they have other helpful ideas and signs and stuff. Um, there are others. But these are some of the ones that I've found that I like. Um, you've heard me say this when to start with, uh, here to help, not to judge. Signs are important because it's one of the first things people see. And when they see that, often the abortion clinic has told them they're going to scream at you, they're going to yell at you, just ignore them, they're mean. And I'm holding this sign. Hmm. Um, free ultrasound, ask me how. Free ultrasound, free pregnancies test. Today's a hard day. I'm here to help. That is not what they're expecting to see. Um, I learned about this next sign. Uh, I thought that's a dumb sign to have. I, you, we should not have that because this is a problem. Honk if you're pro-life. So what happened was I was at the <laughs> clinic one day and I noticed that there were less cars pro-choice people, driving by, laying on their horn for a quarter mile before and after, disturbing my conversations and trying to be like, is there a wreck about to happen? Is What is going on? And it's like, no, it's just another pro-choice person driving by that doesn't <laughs> like us. So one of, my, uh, one of my colleagues had a sign that said, honk if you're pro-life. And I, I'm like, I noticed there's not as many cars. And I look over and there's this sign. And I realized... The pro-life people are quite polite. They come by with a little doo-doo. And the pro-choice people have an aneurysm because they want to (laughs) slam on that horn and drive down the road, and they can't do it. So you can just see them, this this, this turmoil that they're going through. And I don't try to cause people turmoil, but I do get entertained by it. So this is a very effective, practical sign you can have. Um, Abortion hurts women. And then, I regret my abortion. I will say for um, a sign that says, I regret my abortion, you need to be a woman who's actually had an abortion and you've had a lot of um, counseling and help and forgiveness and you're at a good place before you go to the clinic. But if you are, you feel like you can do that, I think it's a very brave, admirable, admirable thing to do. I think it's a good sign. Um, I, I'll make a little side note that um, that just to keep this in mind, and Josh and I hadn't even talked about this. I'm sorry, Josh. No, it's okay. But, you keep doing this. I'm like, what's he going to say next? <laughs> um, understand that the pro-choice people in the clinic, this sign, I regret my abortion, is one of the most infuriating things they've seen. Hmm. Like it really bothers them because they feel like We were there for you in your time of need. And now, Brutus, you're here stabbing us in the back. Hmm. Hmm. We were there for you and now... So just understand that this sign could could create some problems starting conversations and trying to work on getting some of those abortion clinic workers out. I'm not saying don't bring the sign. I'm not saying don't use it. I just want you aware of a problem that it could ha- that could happen with it. Okay. That's interesting. All right. Let's talk about some signs not to have. Okay. I'm just going to go through some quick examples. Any signs with duct tape on it? This is not a good look. Also, don't wear signs like a sandwich board. 
This is the year 2021, not 1908. This is not a good look. Okay, uh, also any signs with a literally insane person on it? Don't you want to talk to him? Oh my goodness. Um, any signs with a gun on it? Okay, don't the, bring this to the abortion clinic. The gun is pointing at the pro-life symbol. Yeah, like one third of the sign is probably okay. It's, I mean, it's not great, but at least it's not horrible. But not, not the rest of it. Um, don't have any weird-looking babies like this one. Jacob sent me this picture from the abortion clinic he was working at. Let me zoom in on that for you guys. Like, this, someone went to a lot of work to make that sign. I don't know what was in their head. Does this make you want to have a baby? <laughs> I just, uh, I don't know. I was like, what? I don't know what people are thinking sometimes. Abortion statistics is another one. So, like. Mm -hmm. Abortion statistics can be very kind of motivating to us pro-life people. When we think about how many babies are died, there's like, there's, there's something like a holocaust going on and we want to do something about that. I get that. But again, remember your audience when you're sidewalk counseling. Is this statistic going to do anything for a woman thinking about having an abortion that day? No, it's just a statistic. Okay, here's another one. This one is really offensive. Unborn lives matter or black babies' lives matter. Don't be the pro-life person that feels like they need to jump on every catchy slogan or successful movement and come up with a pro-life version of that. Because what this indicates to a lot of people is something that's not true. It indicates that we actually don't care about police brutality against African Americans. I know that's not true of anyone in this room. But when we kind of grab onto their movement and try to make our pro-life version of it, again, it's that thing. It's like we're hijacking it so we can try to use it for our own gain. There are some people who see this sign will literally despise you for it. They will think that you're a racist, that you don't care, and it's like, how dare you, especially if you're white, you white pro-lifers, how dare you try to capitalize on what we're trying to do in our movement uh, and, 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 and do this thing. I have attempted to convince pro-life groups that like sell the shirts and signs that do this. I've tried to explain it to them. They don't get it. They're still selling it. Just please don't do it. Um, also, graphic signs. Um, so again, we use abortion images in a brochure. Jacob's going to talk today about how he uses them. He actually uses graphic abortion victim photography in more than half of his conversations oh, yeah. at the abortion clinic. So we are not opposed to graphic visuals. We just think that there's a very certain way to use them. So we'll talk about that, but we don't have them on a sign. Um, and so I'm going to put a, a picture of an example of a graphic sign on the screen, but as we always do, want to give you a warning. If you don't want to see a graphic image of a baby, then just close your eyes for a second. I'm going to put an example on the screen now. This is a sign that, that abolish human abortion um, likes to, to put out. Um, it is not welcoming. It is not approachable. You don't want to go and talk to that person, especially if you're thinking about having an abortion that day. Um, don't use anything that is on this truck. There is so much wrong with this picture. You've got a Christian flag, you've got like, re, you know, re, repent or Paris type signs on it. Just, just don't. Okay, what else do we have? Uh, don't bring anti-Catholic signs. I don't know what it is about some Protestants that feel like anytime they're around Catholics, we've got to try to evangelize now and try to fix this problem. Like every March for Life, anyone, who's been to the March for Life in D.C.? A couple of you. Okay, like every time there's these guys on the side, they're like, oh, cool, but the Catholics are coming by. I'm going to tell them about how they worship Mary because that's going to be super persuasive to them. And they're on these bullhorns and doing things. And they, or they've got signs like this. Jacob took this picture at a sidewalk in front of an abortion clinic. Mm -hmm. It's like, what are you doing? Like this is not, like look, He's a Calvinist. I am way not. We have had that conversation, and we have it as friends, as calm. We can keep on doing that. You know, I can, and I'm going to keep on trying to convince him, and, and it's okay if I never do. Maybe he's predestined to be a Calvinist. I don't know. But I'm trying. I'm going to keep on trying. But that's a different... I'm going to keep on making my free will choices to try to change that. And that's fine. 
this is not the move. This is not the play in front of an abortion clinic. And it's also not going to convince, I, I think, a single I'm, Catholic person. I'm Protestant, and I may or may not be the reason that signs on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One final example. Uh, mommy signs. This is like the mommy don't kill me, mommy I don't want to die signs. And, if, and this is an example of me needing to grow because the organization that I used to work for, they had a mommy sign. I didn't design it, I didn't make it like someone else made it, but you know, it didn't bother me that much. It was like, okay. And now I look back and I see this, okay, this looks really emotionally manipulative. This is not a good sign. Um, so let's talk about some good opening lines. Yeah. Because this is like a really hard thing. It's, like it's, it's kind of like when we do poll table outreach. It's like you've got this little window of time mm -hmm. where someone's like on their way into the abortion clinic and you've got this like you know, five or ten seconds sometimes to say something that gets them to pay attention to you. Yeah. And that can be really hard for people if you're not already ready to go. So let's talk about opening lines. So this is not the time I'm trying to convince them not to have an abortion. I have one single-minded goal. It's very specific and this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get into a conversation with them. I'm because I can't I can't get them the information that I feel like they need and the amount of time they that I have with them as they're walking away and I don't think they're going to hear it. So how do I get them to hear it? They need to come talk to me. What do they believe about me? They believe all these misconceptions about how I hate them. I think pregnancy is a punishment against women for having sex and all these weird ideas that don't actually exist. How do I convince him it's not true? So I start with lines like, I bet this has been a long day for you. I'm sorry for what you're going through. I know this is a hard time for you. What time is it? Do you know what time it is? I just shifted gears big time if you guys didn't catch on. Uh, if I, I know a thing or two about cars, I'm not an expert, but I'll bring up their car. Hey, that's a nice car. Vice versa, if their car's been in a wreck, I don't say that's a piece of junk, but I say, <laughs> I've wrecked a car too in that exact same spot. Sorry, <laughs> I know exactly what you're going through there. Um, this one, this next one's a little controversial for some of my Baptist friends, and I will just say that. <clears throat> Would you like a cigarette? I will smoke a cigarette in a heartbeat with a pro-choice person, especially if it gets me in a conversation with them. This is not something I'm suggesting you under 18 or 21 or whatever the new rule is do. <laughs> <clears throat> Nor am I suggesting you give a cigarette to someone. But if you want to go, um, so I, I had a friend of mine, and she was like, I love that idea. I don't smoke. As a matter of fact, her son has these respiratory problems, and so she hates it when people smoke but she really doesn't like abortion either. And she was like, this could work. This is a great idea. I'm going to go buy cigarettes. She buys like the cigarettes that no one smokes. So uh, um, I am not making an endorsement. I know this is going to sound crazy. You have probably never heard anybody come up and tell you in like a Christian kind of setting what kind of cigarettes to buy, but that's what's going to happen here. So um, marble lights and like cools I have found are pretty universal. That If you have those, you're pretty well set. If you really are mad at me, please come talk to me. I understand. I'm, I'm not confident what I'm saying right now. I need that little, remember like the old, the more you know graphic. <laughs> <laughs> I need that for right here in the, in the seminar. Um, I will say things like, nobody want, really wants to be here. I'm here to listen if you want to talk. We or I am here to listen, not to judge. And then before we wrap up, let's talk about some things not to do or mm. say also. Mm. Um, you need to have a calm demeanor. People are not attracted to or drawn to frantic people. And I see it at the abortion clinic all the time. It makes sense as to why we sidewalk counselors are frantic and panicky. It's because children are dying. They're dying at a rapid rate. If you're standing out there, you're seeing somewhere between 20 to 50 kids go in, or people go in there and come out not pregnant. That's 20 to 50 kids a day at your clinic. I get it. It's frustrating. It's hard. Stay calm. We've talked about uh, don't latch on to other 
messages and it's kind of hijacking, especially I've heard some sidewalk counselors and, and this sidewalk counselor, she's actually really good at getting people out. And she's one of the reasons she's just very persistent and she is so kind. She has a lot of kind, just love pouring from her mouth. But I've seen this happen hundreds of times where they say black lives matter or black baby lives matter. And I have never seen that be effective and people come talk. As a matter of fact, I feel like it seems like people walk away faster. It comes across as condescending and in like you're hijacking something. Um, this next one's controversial. I'm going to speak in pragmatic terms on what I have found to be effective. Uh, I, I did this in the beginning of my sidewalk counseling to... To put it bluntly, I just quit doing it because it just wasn't effective. It doesn't work. And that is to say things like, or have a sign that says, adoption's the option. I feel like I want to explain that one a little bit. Um, there's this weird... It's hard to explain what somebody who's abortion-minded is, is going through. There's a lot of feelings there, and the thoughts can contradict each other. And this is going to be one of those times. And you're going to say, Jacob, that doesn't really make sense. That's okay, because this doesn't really make sense. And they haven't put this together yet. Um, so that, that goes with, like, I told you earlier how they're like, yes, I'm pregnant with a baby. And I haven't had to argue with people or try to convince them it's not a clump of cells. It is a child. There's also this idea that it's not in existence yet. I told you it's going to be contradictory. I'm, but that's where it is. It's just like feeling it's not in existence, but I'm, I am pregnant with a baby. And the idea of just giving that baby away, that's not what I'm seeing. Adoptive parents, I think it's a, it's a gift kind of situation. It's a very difficult thing. But the idea of them doing that is... They don't want to just give their baby away and know what the rest, not know how that child is going to be taken care of, what's going on, and they don't know you. And for you to say, we'll adopt your baby, they're like, I don't know you. I just met you on the street in front of a, you know, in front of an abortion clinic. And like, you people are weird. And that's okay. We're a good weird, I hope. But they don't understand anything of this. I've talked to, dozens and dozens of people, especially towards the beginning of trying to get people out, and I thought this was the ticket. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about how we can, we can adopt their child. And I actually had a conversation with my wife about, you know, are we ready to adopt a child? Yes, we are. Okay, we'll do this if this is what's necessary. I found other couples who were ready to adopt. So I had their picture on my phone and everything, and I was using this as one of my go-tos, and it was turning off conversations. It doesn't it doesn't have the effect. It's us trying to solve a problem in a way that isn't solving the problem for them. Um, we, we can get into that some more later, but let's keep moving. Um, don't kill your baby. This is fetal tunnel, tunnel vision from a sidewalk counselor. Uh, they will see you as, if you think that I'm a baby killer, then you think I'm a horrible person and you're not going to want to have a conversation or you're not going to be nice to me um, if you think that kind of thing about me. Um, I love it when people do this for people who've had a, 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 an abortion scheduled and then the community comes together and throws them a baby shower is one of the most beautiful things in the world. Careful about using it as one of your opening lines. It's creepy. It's beautiful. It doesn't take a whole lot of rapport, but you can build some rapport with them and bring it up. I'm not telling you don't ever bring it up. I'm just telling you don't make it one of your opening lines. Um, oh, this is, this is one of the worst. We, this, this, we heard about this one from a news story. We looked into it. We believe it's credible. Um, uh, what did your baby do wrong? You do not want to come across as emotionally manipulative, and that is what this is doing. So once again, this isn't about making fun of people. 
Every person represented in this slideshow is doing their best. They hate abortion, and they got up, they left their house, and went to do something about that. We honor them for that. What we hope that you take from this is basically what I hope the pro-life movement takes from our work in general at ERI, which is to learn from other pro-lifers what works and what can be improved upon, and then go out there and be a more effective and more gracious pro-life advocate. We're going to go to a break in a minute. I just want to tell you basically what's going to be happening today as far as the, 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 the rest of the schedule. We're going to take a 10-minute break. We're going to come back, and Jacob and I are going to talk about his, what he actually does when it's time to have these conversations and try to save babies, what we call the conversation-oriented method. So we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to have our first Q&A time, about 15 minutes probably of Q&A. So uh, at some point, Liberty and Lois and or Sherilyn will be collecting note cards. Maybe you'll hold them up and they'll collect them if you have a question on it. Um, so we'll have that. And then we'll have a 45-minute lunch break. That'll start at about 11.40. And we'll do that for 45 minutes. We're going to come back. And then we're going to try to help put some of these things together for you by having some role play. Liberty and I are going to pretend to be different kinds of abortion-minded people. Jacob will play Jacob. And just try to give you a sense of, like, in real time, what does it look like when he's sidewalk counseling? Because it would be weird if I brought all of you to Atlanta to watch him on the sidewalk. There would be just, like, a whole audience. <laughs> so we'll try to get, give you a chance to do that here, and then we'll have another Q&A session after that, because hopefully you have some more questions after you've gotten to see some of the other things that he says. Then we'll have a final 10-minute break, and then we'll come back and we'll have one more session. We're going to talk about how to handle the police, because the police are going to get called on you at some point, and that can be very intimidating. If you're a law-abiding citizen like me, that just like freaks out even if I get pulled over because they're speeding a little bit. Like, I, We want to kind of prepare you for that. Um, and then we'll have a final session of either Q&A and or role play. I'm probably actually going to take it to a vote and um, try to get a sense of what would be most helpful for you. Um, we'll kind of leave that up to you, and then we will wrap up the seminar. So right now, let's take a 10-minute break. Please be back here by 10.50. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's talk about the conversation-oriented method. So Jacob, before we get into talking about like the meat of the conversation, there's, there's kind of a middle step I want you to explain kind of briefly, which is talking about what do you do in between your opening line, hey, I'm here to help not to judge, or whatever that is. You're getting them to like stop moving into the clinic, but then they're still there, right? They're still over there. You want to try to get them to come down to you, where you're legally standing. So what are some things that you're saying or things that you're doing to try to draw them to you so that you can have the conversation-oriented method happen? Yeah, COVID's made this a little bit more difficult. I'll just, I'll say that. But one of the, one of the things they do is I'm looking, with these opening lines, I'm looking for some kind of glance or acknowledgement, eye contact, stop. I mean, if they stop in their tracks, that's great. Most of the time that doesn't happen. They just, they keep walking. So I don't want you to think I'm saying, oh yeah, do these things. They always work. Most of the time they don't. So, but the sometimes that they do, as soon as they stop, I may see another one of these kind of opening line things, but I also will say something like, and I'm not trying to give you guys scripts. It's important you understand that. I, you are welcome to use any of this stuff that I'm telling you, but I don't want you to think, like, this is all I can do or whatever. Like, find your own voice. Find what works for you, what yeah. you're comfortable with. I say things like, um, listen, I don't know what you believe about me, but you just need to know I, don't, I am not here to judge people. I'm, I'm here because I care about people. I think people matter. I'd love to hear your story. I don't bite. I left my things at home. I am house broke. My name's Jacob. And um, I, I might not make all those little things, little jokes in there or whatever. Maybe I say one. Maybe I don't even say any of them. If they look really stressed, I probably won't say any of them. Um, I'm, you got to be careful with humor. We've got a whole podcast on it. But... I'm just trying to get them to come down. Uh, it's worked so well, and it's so frustrating, I can't do this anymore, but when I say, hey, my name's Jacob, and if this front step is, is like the line, 
where I can go to, um, I'll, I'll step right up to that point and say, my name's Jacob, what's your name? And just putting your hand out like you're expecting them to shake your hand. And it's often like, well, I, I guess I got to go shake his hand and introduce myself or at least say hi. If you come across as kind, you're, because you're kind, you're going to get a lot farther in these, in, in these interactions. This is one of the toughest things is getting people to come talk to us. So then once you've gotten them to come down, why don't you go ahead and talk to us about the first step of the conversation-oriented method? Mm -hmm. You've heard me talk and talk and talk and Josh talk and talk and talk. And we haven't really listened to you guys much, which is the exact opposite of what I want you to do uh, at, the, at the clinic. As soon as you get them talking, I want you to get them to keep talking. We've got so much information, so much we want to tell them, so many resources. Calm down. Listen to their story. You're going to do a couple things. You're going to meet them where they are. And you're going to start gathering very, very valuable information for later on. I will ask them, what's your story? I may say something like, I know it wasn't part of your five-year plan to be here. So what happened? How'd you end up here? Must be a hard day. What's going on? How? I'll ask them things like, uh, once I'm going, I'll ask very open-ended questions. Are you religious at all? They say yes. I'll ask them to explain that. I'm very careful not to project anything of my personal beliefs and views on them, I am just in information gathering mode, which is also compassionate, be with someone and where they're hurting mode. At some point, I'm going to ask them, the abortion-minded person, how far along are you? Or if I'm talking to the driver, how far along is she? When they tell me, if they're there for a surgical abortion, I basically know they're somewhere past eight weeks. Usually, if it's before eight weeks, it, they're probably going to take RU486. There's a little wiggle room on how that works. I'm not getting into the details. I'm just, that's my practical advice for at the clinic. They're probably just past... 18 weeks, depending on your state laws, as to how far along they are. It's good for you to understand what's going on at that clinic. At what, to what point do they do abortions? They might be legal for all nine through all nine months, but that clinic only goes to 20 weeks or 24 weeks or, or whatever that is. But I'll ask them, "How far along are you?" And they tell me, and I go, I go into our fetal development booklet here. And I'm going through all this very quickly. This may be 45 minutes before I get here. I'm asking them about their job. Uh, where are they going to school? Where do they want to go to school? Do they want to go to school? Are they at a position that they like in life other than they're here right now? And so I'll open this up as soon as they tell me about where they are and I'll point to the picture. It's usually in ours we got seven to 13, a uh, seven week, and then it goes to 30 or 13 weeks, and then 16. So it's somewhere usually on this lower part of this, this page here between seven and 17 weeks. And I point to that child. And at this point, they're talking, they've been talking about the pregnancy or this or that and can't, got, can't be pregnant. And I make a subtle but intentional shift where I go, so your child looks about, well, this is what your child looks like right now. Or if I'm talking to the driver and it's not his, the child. So this is what your child looks like about now. Okay. I hear you've got 
like a lot going on financially. This is a bad time and it could ruin your, your career. You might not have a place to live. Those are all really scary things and I'm not... It's important that you guys know. I don't argue with them about any of that. I don't try to tell them, no, it's not a big deal. Don't worry, we'll take care of it. It's, it's fine. I'm not nothing. I'm just, yeah, that's hard. Man, that sounds like a tough position you're in. Makes sense. It makes perfect sense to me why you're here now. This is so against our intuitions. To be like, yeah, you are in a really bad place. I understand why you're here. I didn't say I support that you're here. But I'm meeting this human being at where they are in this moment of time and just saying, now I've built a tremendous amount of rapport by doing that. I've found a lot of common ground with them, and I don't feel that I've compromised my position. So <clears throat> I'll ask him about, okay, you're about here. I said, okay, listen, I don't have the ability to do anything. I told you I care about people. One of the ways that I think um, I can help people is by just giving them all the information, making sure they know as much as they can. Because I think human beings make the best decisions when they have all the information. I, I, I'm kind of a weird belief system where I actually think people are smarter than most people give them credit. And I think that most people just need better information and accurate information. So that's what I'm here to do today. I'm here to give you the most accurate, best information I can. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to try to manipulate you. I'm just going to be here to tell you the truth for what you want to hear. If you don't want to hear it, I'll leave. I won't talk to you anymore. You can walk away anytime you want. You are free to do that. In order to give you all the information, I want to show you what's going to happen in there. I don't want you to be unaware of something. So, in order to show you, I need to show you what's on this next page right here, on, on this thing. And this is a picture of an abortion. So I think it's important that you understand everything that's happening here. So in order for you to have all the information, can I show you the next page? Okay, pause for a second. I am very, very, very careful about how I say this. What I don't say is, I've got an abortion picture. You want to see that? I say... I want you to have all the information. In order to have all the information, I need to show you this next picture. To give you all the information, can I show you this picture? Something like that. In order to give you all the information, I need to show you this picture. Can I show this to you? If they say no, it's kind of like they're saying, I want to be ignorant. I don't want all the information. I may or may not like, see that depending on how much rapport. I usually choose not to say that and just imply it. Not trying to be manipulative, but I am trying to use everything I can so that they'll look at this picture. If you set it up well, your chances of them seeing it are really high. I hate giving out statistics because I don't know what they are because I didn't I haven't been polling it. I can just tell you it's a very, very, very high percentage chance to say yes if you set it up well. If you set it up poorly, it's the complete opposite. It's a very, very high chance they're going to say no. They're going to say, no, I don't want to see that bloody picture. <clears throat> so set it up carefully. We go over this in our course quite a bit. If you want to, And I believe it's in your hand out there. So let's go back to I've asked them for their permission to show them the next page. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and flip to this next page. I want to just tell you guys that I'm going to do that. So if you're uncomfortable seeing this, it makes complete sense. Don't worry. There's no shame here. Just don't, 
don't look up. I'll tell you when it's down. But I'll say to them, can I show you what's going to happen in the abortion so that you have all the information? And they say, yes, and go to that page. And I say, so your child, you said about, um, about here. So you're right about in this, this spot here. I think this may be one of the most important things you do in the conversation that I really want to drive home. I really want you to pay attention to. Because it goes against every single one of your intuitions. When you open this page up, and you invite them to view it, show them about where your child's at. You need to do something very, very, very difficult. You need to shut your mouth and wait. And every second will feel like a minute. And it may take 15 seconds, and I guarantee you it will feel like 15 minutes. And it is the best awkward pause you will ever experience. Because what's happening is their entire world just got rocked. They kind of knew it was a baby. They felt like it was a baby. But it's also a problem, and they need to get rid of this problem. So they're here to get rid of this problem. And now they see what getting rid of this problem looks like. There's a human being there that's just been torn to shreds. And I've just implied and showed them that it is not just any human being, but their child. This is what their child's going to look like. Can you just, let's just wrap our mind around how much processing all that's happening. And yeah, it maybe 15 seconds feels like an eternity, but it's really not that long. I will wait however long it takes until they break the silence. It might be with just them clearing their throat. It might be them saying something, and then I'll join in. I'm going to say it again. I want it to be really clear. You need to wait. When you show this, I've seen way too many people crack this open and then start talking and they just ruined all the processing that's happening in their head that is just so important. Sometimes we as pro-lifers talk too fast. We have too much information. In case you haven't figured it out, I'm guilty of that. We have to slow down. We have to let them think. We have to leave pauses. I just want to propose that awkward silences in front of the abortion clinic are actually can be really good. Really good. We're taught to not let those happen, to keep talking, don't be silent, use your voice. I'm telling you something a little different here. I'm telling you at times, be silent. Don't say anything. After you've just wrecked their world, you've showed them a graphic visual, we are at a very low point in the conversation. Don't want you to leave them at a low point in the conversation. We are told to lift and build people up. So we need to do that at this point now. I heard from this uh, public speaker, a famous individual, said something to me, or not to me, that I heard and I went, that is really powerful. He said, most people haven't reached their potential. Most people have no idea of what they are truly capable of. And we live in this world where we're told these people are dumb or these people can't. I just don't believe that. I think that, and I'll tell I'll tell the person I'm talking to. 
I don't think you've begun to reach your true potential. I think you're at a really tough spot in your life, and that's why you're here at this abortion, abortion clinic. But I'll just be honest with you. I think that you can do better. I think that you've got, you're far more capable than you understand. I don't mean that in a demeaning way. I mean that in a way that I don't think you know who you are and what you're capable of. I think you've got a bad view of yourself. So where do you, and now I'm changing tones. I'm changing subject lines. Where do you want to go? Who do you want to be? Where, what, what is, what is like, What's your dream? Well, let him talk. And I'll find lots of common ground with your dreams. I want to hear it. I want to process that. Now things are changing. They just went from a really low point, the, all these awful things. And we're moving into where they do want to go. And after we've talked about that for a little while, I'm going to say something like, okay, you know I'm here because I think people matter. I think unborn people matter. I think abortion is a horrible thing. I've showed you pictures as to why. I don't want that happening to your kid today. I'm just going to put all my cards on the table. I like telling people, I told you I was going to be honest with you. I'm just going to keep being honest with you. I'm not going to hold back. You're not going to be like, I wonder what that guy's thinking because I'm just going to tell you. I don't want this to happen to your kid today. Let's see, I'm going to go back to that picture. I don't want this to happen to your kid today. I don't want it to happen to any kid. I want to stop this from happening. I want to help you stop this from happening. And I think, no, I don't think. I really believe you can get to the dreams that you want to do without doing this. And you said something a little while ago that I heard. You say you don't want to become a mom. You're not ready for it. This is bad timing. I, I, I actually agree with you. This is bad timing. I hear that you don't believe you're ready. I'm not even going to argue. You probably have an idea. I'm not totally on board with you, but for different reasons. But I agree with you. This is a bad time. The thing that I think we disagree about that's really important here is you say you don't want to become a mom. You're not ready to have a child. The part that I disagree with is I think you're already a mom. You already have a child. This is what your baby looks like right now. The question is, what are you, what are you going to do with this child? I know that sounds cold and mean to be putting that pressure on you, but that's where we are. That's what's happening today. So, I'm going to make a proposal to you. This clinic wants your money. They'll always take you back. Can't undo what you do in there, though. How about, how about you guys pick your favorite restaurant? And you take a pause. We go talk about this. And I haven't told you this, but I've got this crazy amount of vast resources. It sounds crazy, but I've got so much resources behind me. I'm not here alone. I've got hundreds or thousands of people behind me supporting me to make sure I'm here to tell you, you matter, you can do better, and we want to help you get to where you need to go in life. And we're not here to give you a handout, but we are here to give you a hand up. So how about you pick the restaurant, I buy, and we just go sit down and talk and eat. What do you say? You can come back. They'll take you back. They want your money. They will take you back. You know that old saying, the money is the root of all evil, or the love money is the root of all evil? Try not paying them and see what happens. Try not paying me and see what happens. Because I won't take your money. I don't want your money. So who are you going to trust? The people who are saying, pay us? Or you don't get anything? Or the person that says, don't worry about paying me. And I'm going to take you to other places and they won't ask for your money either. They don't want it. Trust me, what they're giving you costs a lot of money. 
but they don't want your money. So what do you say we just go grab a bite to eat? And <clears throat> I have a little bit of a sneaky method I'm using here. Usually, not always, if she's there for a surgical abortion, she hasn't eaten that day because she's not allowed to. Our flesh is a very powerful thing. And when we want to eat, we really want to eat. <laughs> and I'm going to feed into that hunger and say, your favorite restaurant, I'll take you there. You order whatever you want. I got it. And <clears throat> if she does decide to go eat, it's just, I don't know, there's something about sitting and eating a meal with people. It, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to put my finger on it, but it's where most of us often have some of our best relationship building experiences. It's so profound when I take people who are abortion minded and get them a bite to eat and we sit down and I, sh we, I get to know their story and they get to know some of my story and we're having a conversation and resources that I have never taken someone out to eat and then they decide to go back for an abortion. Not that I know of, it's never happened. But I have taken people in for an ultrasound, and they've gotten an ultrasound, seen a picture of their baby, and gone back and had an abortion. It might just be my experience. It's fine. I will say something when it comes to going out to eat. <clears throat> maybe, maybe you're like, I don't know if I have the money for that. That sounds expensive. I'm kind of concerned. Like, what's, what's the problem? First and foremost, if that's a problem for you, I'll pay for it. Actually, my donors will, and they'll be thrilled to do it. And speaking of which, if you want to... Um, if you're willing to do a little support raising, this is like the easiest thing in the world to support raise for because this is one of the, the most effective things you can do. Like, it's not hard to say, hey, um, I'm going to go get somebody out of an abortion clinic by God's grace, and then I want to take them out to eat. Would you pay for that so we can talk about them not killing their kid? And people go, how much you want? It's so easy to support race for. And that's one of the reasons I can say, because I know how wonderful the pro-life community is, how much people out there love them. And so if, if there's any kind of financial issue there, just let me just tell you, it's God's problem, not yours. Just ask him to help handle it. You be faithful and go get it. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of follow-up questions in a second, yeah. but just real quick. I know we're getting ready to kind of wrap up this session. We're going to do Q&A soon. So if Liberty and any other team members at Oregon Right to Life can start collecting question cards, and if you have a question, hold it up so they can collect that because we're going to go to that pretty soon. But before we do questions, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. So tell me, and this is going to go a little deeper than we did a couple of days ago, but I just had this thought, and I'm interested. I have no idea what you're going to say, but I'm interested. When you're there at Red Robin with them or wherever, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're, you're, you know, you've gotten them to go there, Anything intentional that you're doing with that time? Like anything that you're trying to accomplish? What are you talking about? What's happening at that point? Um, that's a good question. And I'm trying to get to know them. Oh, I forgot some really important point I need to get back to. And it's horrible I forgot this because I forget it all the time. But um, <clears throat> so you're sitting there. Relax. Just be like, I'm making a new friend. Yeah. Um, you've already done the hard work. It's not that there's no more hard work, but the vast majority of the difficult stuff has already happened. Yeah. You're now just walking alongside them. It's important that you understand you don't have to have all the answers. You don't, you don't have to know and have all the solutions. And um, I, I tell people it doesn't matter what you need. Um, we can get it. We'll get it. If you need it, we're going to get it. I had, I had one lady call me and say, I need, she was from China. She got pregnant from a horrible pilot. And uh, 
she was scared that if she went back to China, she was going to be forced into an abortion. And so she was desperately looking for a place to live. And so I kind of put out there to my network, like great people who are responsible for me being here today, um, large part. Uh, and they were like, yep, found one, no problem. We'll take her. It's good. Within 12 hours of her supposed to be going in or 24 hours, um, the, the couple that decided to take her, um, they weren't able to. They just, they, there were some things that happened. They just weren't able to do that. So I'm like, great, she's about to be on the streets in 24 hours. What am I going to do? And to be completely honest with you, I was not worried a bit. I've just seen God come through too many times and the pro-life community come through too many times. And within a few hours, I had another house that was even better. And she was in with a wonderful um, with a wonderful family who just loved on her and helped her through for 18 months until the child was born. And then the child got to an old enough age where she was comfortable going back to China and, and she didn't feel like they were going to take her child. Something really important, I'm sorry I forgot this. Uh, early on in the conversation, I, um, I want to get their phone number and the way I do that, right. because if they... Oh, we, we, I skipped an entire section. Um, <clears throat> the way I do that is I say, look, I want you to have my, my contact info, so let me send that to you. Um, what's your phone number? I'm just going to text it to you real quick. And then I text it to them. Now I watch them get the text message, so I know it's good because I write down the wrong number all the time or they write down the wrong number when they're sending it to me or something like that. Now I know I've got their contact info. Um, Josh, help me fix everything I just goofed up. Where, where are we going from here? So, uh, I, well, I was going to ask you about this, the one other thing that we haven't talked about yet in this section, I think, which is you talked about how to encourage the abortion-minded woman yes. to leave the clinic. Yeah. And so talk a little bit before we go to Q&A about the driver. Because okay. there's a really interesting thing that I've learned. I mean, I've learned all kinds of things about Selva Counseling despite having hired this awesome guy. But I've had my mind changed about multiple aspects of sidewalk counseling because the way that I used to think about sidewalk counseling was this is a really good pro-life activity for young pro-life women to do. Because in my mind, a young pro-life woman is going to be the most kind of relatable and approachable to an abortion-minded woman. And having been through this process with you, I've learned, oh, it really depends on the abortion-minded person. For example, we, sometimes you can have elderly women uh, on the sidewalk, and you would think, like, okay, well, I guess they can pray. No, there are some girls that are like, they see her, and they're like, I, it's like they see their sweet grandmother like projected onto this person, and that's who they feel safe with. They skip all the, all the, all the young people and go right to her. Mm -hmm. And, and, like, and so like that's really valuable. But then also, Jacob changed my mind about the idea that there should be guys sidewalk counseling. Because I was like, well, obviously not. Like, <laughs> we, need, you know, we need pro-life men doing things, but like, this is not the thing. This is, you know, this is, this is what, you know, we saw pro-life women doing this because what woman's going like, to approach this guy? And I was wrong about that. And you've got some really interesting thoughts about why we need male sidewalk counselors too. We don't only need male sidewalk counselors. We always want them in pairs typically at least one man and one woman. But talk a bit about why it's valuable to have men specifically sidewalk counseling. Yeah, I was just surprised to find out that how many other men are at the abortion clinic. Usually it's a guy that got her pregnant, it's a guy that's paying for it, and it's a guy that drove her. Often all the same guy. And so... What that translates to is she's usually in the waiting room or abortion clinics will often have you come back for two, three, maybe four visits to the back. Like you'll leave the waiting room, go to the back for, they'll take your blood pressure, they'll do an ultrasound, they do, and they, and they just keep going back and forth and back and forth. And for a lot of these abortion, abortion facilities that do um, a high volume, they're doing it in the most efficient way possible. They don't care how long you wait. So it's not like they're taking one, they're going through everything, and then she's out. So it's not uncommon for a woman, for the woman and whoever's with her to be there for three, four, maybe even five hours I've seen in a day. So part of it is like, 
you actually have a lot more time than you realize. Well, who the heck is going to sit in a waiting room for four hours? So the guys usually get, they'll go in to start with, but then 45 minutes later or so, they're like, I'm going to go outside. Let's get some air. I'll go get some air. <laughs> and so they come outside. They're pacing around the parking lot. They're smoking cigarettes. Told you about that. They're, <clears throat> uh, they're, they're sitting in their car. They're just bored. And they go out and pick up a bite to eat or something. Often they haven't. So I have a lot of opportunity to talk to the men at this point. A lot more than I thought. As a matter of fact, most of the time, um, God's used me to get somebody out of the clinic so that they change their mind. It started with the man. He's done it in very loving, compassionate ways, not like being a bully. But very often, he's there because he thinks this is what she wants to do, and he hasn't even said what he wants to do. And I've just helped him to get a voice to say, actually, I don't want to do this. And she goes, oh, me either. And sometimes it's been that complicated. And he's gone, I don't want to do this. Well, you should go tell her. And he goes and tells her. And she's like, I don't want to do this either. Okay, let's go. You hungry? Yeah, let's go get a bite to eat. <laughs> sometimes it, I'm giving you a lot of worst case scenarios here, but sometimes it's that easy. What else do we need to hit, Josh? Um, talk a little bit about, so you're going to try to sometimes convince the man to do mm. something very awkward yeah, and hard. So why don't you talk a little bit about that before we go to Q&A. So say I'm talking to the driver <clears throat> and the, the, the woman's inside, and um, I've gone over all of this with this, with this pamphlet, and, and we're actually going to role play this in a little bit, but <clears throat> I have gotten to the point where he's like, yeah, this is a bad idea. I don't want it to happen. At that point, I have more bad news for him. <laughs> because I'm like, you're going to have to do something I can't do. And it's not, it's, I'm not going to ask you to do anything illegal or could end you up in jail. How far would you go to save a child? Not, I'm not even talking about your unborn child right now. I'm just, just a child, a two-year-old walking out into the street. Oh, I'd jump out in front of the car. I'd, I'd grab that kid. I'd do whatever it takes. Okay, now I'm, let's go back to how far are you willing to go in this case? Because this, the reason I'm telling you this is it's going to get real awkward real fast. And, and it's going to be difficult. And you're going to have to be calm but very firm. And they're like, oh, okay. Okay, what, what are we talking about here? You need to go to that clinic and say... Hi, my name's so and so. I'm here to speak with so and so. Um, that's my wife or my girlfriend, or I'm the driver. I'm the driver, and it's my wife, or whatever your relationship is. But I'm the reason um, she got there. I'm like, uh, I'm 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 part of this. Uh, I need to speak to her right now, please. And they're going to come up with something like, "Oh, she's not available," and you're going to say, "Nope." I need to speak with her right now. And they're going to say, well, you know, she's in the middle of blah, 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 and she's not available. And you're going to say, no, you told me this was a non-invasive thing. No big deal. No problem. Now you're telling me something different. We have a problem. Are you holding her against her will? I told you it's going to get awkward. Because I'm starting to feel like you're holding her against her wheel, her will, and I am very concerned. I'm very concerned for her safety. I'm very concerned as to what's going on. Did something happen that went wrong? I've heard that things can go very wrong in there. Is that what's happened today? Is she back there bleeding to death? What is going on? Why can't I see so-and-so? Sir, calm down. I'm not yelling. I'm not screaming. I'm being very firm. I must see so-and-so now. Are you telling me that is not going to happen? Mm. 
are you telling me that I may not see because you told me this was a non-invasive surgery, yet this has just gotten very concerning to me. Do I need to call the police in order to see this, to see this person? Told you it's going to get awkward. Bad news is this is awkward. Good news is it's going to make a great story one day. <laughs> <laughs> and you will get to see her. If you are firm, I don't want you doing anything illegal, but if you are firm, you'll, you'll, you'll get the opportunity. Um, unless she just doesn't want to, and I'm not going to go there right now. Um, but <clears throat> the clinic doesn't want the police called. The clinic absolutely does not want the police called. It's bad luck. It, it's more than a, yes, bad luck, but it's also they lose money because other people are like, I don't want to be a part of this chaos. I don't want anything to do with the police coming around. What are the police here for? When I went to the dentist, the police weren't involved. So why are the police here? Um, <clears throat> what's going on here? So that's the kind of prep work that you need to do with him. But before you, you let him go, or her, it might be her sister or girlfriend. Or I mean, I, one, one time I was at the clinic and there were five girls that came with this one girl. They were all part of a sorority. So I had to talk to Five different young ladies, very smart. They look like something out of like a, a, a pop band or something. They look like they were all musicians. And anyway, that's not a bad thing. Um, and anyway, so I'm trying to talk to, I'm getting lost in the story. So wrap it up so we can do keep. I'm sorry. That's all I have to say on that. Because <laughs> like, what's, what's happening? I don't even know where you're going right now. Okay, I'm sorry. we've got about 10 minutes for questions. There will be more time for questions, so we might not even get through all the cards okay. that Liberty has right can now. But let's do questions for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to break for lunch. Me? Because I bet you're getting hungry, and you would like something in your belly. Okay, thank you, Josh and Jacob. So I was hoping, I know this is so counter your guys' personality, and nature and the whole reason of what you do, but can you go rapid fire with your answers? You always ask me to do that, and I'm not. <laughs> and you never actually we'll, do it. Don. We'll do our best. We'll do our best. Shoot. Okay. Um, so we actually had a couple questions that were similar, which is interesting because I have a huge stack here, and most everyone asked something different. Wow. But there were a couple questions about the logistics of reaching people when specifically we have a lot of abortion clinics in the area that have. Areas you can't enter. I can't hear you. They have parking lots where there's like separating the sidewalk and the doors the women enter. So they're asking how logistically you can reach people that are not passing you right on the sidewalk. We have a, an entire um, module talking about figuring out where you can and cannot legally stand. And so you need to go through that module. It's, it's, it's the most boring one there. Um, it definitely was the most hey. boring for me to make, but it's very, very helpful in understanding what the laws are so that you can be the most effective you can. There's also another module on if you can't get to, if you can't really do sidewalk counseling, like there's an abortion clinic in Atlanta where it's on the eighth floor of a building. There's all sorts of stuff in there. We don't really know who's going in and why they're going in. They might just be going in for a yoga appointment or a doctor or to get a sandwich in one of the restaurants downstairs. So there's a lot of those kinds of situations. We might be focused on secondary goal, which is helping close down the clinic. We've got a whole part of our course on that. I would encourage you to go into that because it's, it's longer than I can do in a reasonable amount of time here. Go. Hey, look at you. Good job. Little clap for that. <laughs> okay. What about babies with disabilities? What happens and what do you say when the mother or the other person argues that? Like they know the baby has been diagnosed with a disability. Oh, poor prenatal diagnosis. Very difficult situation um, for us sidewalk counselors and for them because this is a child they wanted. Yep. We have a whole module on this. Um, you guys are asking great questions. I don't want to just, just tell them that. Though. Can you give, give them like one thing yeah. or something? Yeah. Um, Rapidly. Is, I, I made the mistake when I first got into that of trying to argue with them to say their doctor might be wrong or that the diagnosis is not accurate, or you never know. Oh, that's a mistake. Forget that. Throw that out. What you can do is empathize with them where they are. I'm so sorry. That is so scary. You didn't want to, have, you've never wanted to have an abortion. You wanted this child, and now you're stuck with this situation. Um, did you name your baby? 
Now start using the baby's name. You're humanizing the child. Um, I will also say, or I've been taught to say, I didn't figure these things out. I, I was taught by some wonderful people at Be Not Afraid. It's important. I just want you to understand with everything that's happening with the doctors and stuff, I think there's something that's not being pointed out right now. Your baby is safe. Your baby is warm. Your baby is comfortable. And when you found out about this horrible thing, that was the worst moment. And understand that nothing has changed with your child. Your child's the same before you found out and the same after. And your child is comfortable right now. You can, she said rapid fire. So yeah, wrap it up. Quickly. <laughs> you can get into um, self-preservation for the parents on this is going to be extremely difficult if you elect to end your child's life versus if you let your child die naturally. There's great resources. Be Not Afraid is where we go with that. We've got a whole course or we've got a whole module of our course that talks about this in much greater detail. Next. Okay, what is the app that shows fetal development? You mentioned earlier. Oh, what is the app? Don't ask me about I don't technology. Remember. So I know there's if, a bonus if you guys give video it to me, in the email. course where we talk about a couple of apps. We've yes. found a couple of iPad apps that we liked a lot and we yeah. like demoed them on the course. I don't I feel like one of them is called C Baby. Yep. C Baby is one of them. Um, but we demoed a few of them. Also, this brochure. Unfortunately, we were pretty low on supplies before we came here, so I can't just like give all of you one of these. You can order them from us. We actually need to like reorder a bunch from the printer. We only sell them for 68 cents a piece plus shipping. Something that was implied with that question that I'm just going to go over really quick. You need to stay off your phone at pretty much all times when you're doing sidewalk counseling. This becomes a barrier. It's weird. It separates us. So I actually don't want you um, using that app, it's much better if you can get some stuff. We designed this because we didn't see anything else out there that was um, getting what we wanted. We didn't design it for sidewalk counseling. We designed it for um, doing college university stuff, but it does work really well. This does not work well on the sidewalk to hand out as information. Don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. This is a tool that you hang on to and you use. If they ask you for it, you can give it to them, but you just need to give them some disclaimers. Do not hand this out to people as they drive by. Okay, uh, when you go to the restaurant, do you go with a single woman by herself? Great question. I'm going to leave that up to you and your family and your questioning and everything. I want you to be safe and keep in mind, is this a safe kind of thing? And what does the optics look, look like and everything? I'm pretty careful about it. Basically, every time I go, I have other sidewalk counselors with me. Another great reason to have other sidewalk counselors with you. So you can be bringing someone else, um, another sidewalk counselor along. So you've got like three people. Uh, have you consulted with post-abortive pro-life women in developing your approach and curriculum? Have I or how did I? Have, have you? you. Have, have I, yes. Okay. Do you want to expand on that at all? That? <laughs> <laughs> um, just understanding uh, some of the, I, I developed the, the <clears throat> burning building scenario, um, talking to women who were post-abortive, just wonderful human beings who were willing to delve in to what they were really going through at the time, which is just invaluable information for me um, because I wanted to ask a lot of questions. And let's be honest, these weren't easy questions to answer and to ask somebody. They could come across as very mean and judgmental and and but I really just needed to find some answers to these things. So I, there's there's a uh, one of the first people I was doing sidewalk counseling with, Lauren Whitaker, helped. Um, another uh, friend of our family, uh, Heather Creech, helped. Uh, let's see here. And I'm sorry, I'm sure I'm forgetting some others. But yes, some of that development stuff was after talking to them and talking to women who were going through an abortion. Well, one thing I feel like post-abortive women that I've talked to have appreciated about Jacob's approach, because this is a pretty unique approach to sidewalk counseling. Usually the approach is something like, how do I as quickly as possible convince her to go to the pregnancy center? Um, and, there, and there are some times that can be very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, but Jacob's method takes more time. Um, and something that uh, post-abortive people can appreciate is like, if it's a lot more obvious with this method that we care about her. We're not just trying to get her somewhere else. We care about her. We want to hear her, hear about her problems, give her a hand up instead of a hand out. 
Um, and so uh, I, I just know there are a lot of supportive people that just felt like, like if there was someone out there, I wouldn't have had the abortion. But I went there and there was no one there and I went in. And so, yeah, we've definitely had supportive people appreciate the training. Let's do one final question and then we'll break. Okay. This one I think is appropriate because we did a lot of don'ts this morning. Yep. How do you help the people that are doing the don'ts? <laughs> oh, this is people? the most common question we get. How do we help the people that are doing the don'ts? Oh, I'm not even answering it now. We will answer that. We will answer that, but I'm not going to touch it now. Because we don't have time? No, we don't have time. Okay, so let's make that the number of the first question for the next q and Is that okay. cool? Yep. If we knew that was going to come up today, we know about some of the things that have been going on in Oregon. We've got some thoughts. But yeah, I, I think let's not hold you and make you wait for us to do a 10-minute rant about ineffective methods. Let's, but, we'll, but we will talk about that. So we're going to break for lunch. You've got 45 minutes. So I would like you to be back here by about 1230.